In this video, we're going to continue to look at intermolecular forces, and now we turn our attention to polar molecules. And polar molecules have a permanent dipole, unlike the nonpolar molecules, which only have induced dipole. Um, and if you remember uh, from Gen Chem 1, we can determine if a molecule is polar uh, based on its geometry and if it has polar bonds. Now, since these molecules have permanent dipoles, what happens is that they can always be lined up so that the dipoles uh, face each other. And this is a relatively strong um, intermolecular force. Therefore, polar molecules have higher boiling points and melting points relative to nonpolar molecules of the same uh, size and shape. All right. So let's just take a step back and look at our trends of intermolecular attraction now. And we've said this a couple times now, but the stronger the attraction is between molecules, the more energy it takes to separate them and higher boiling point and melting point. Um, so when we're boiling a liquid, what we're doing um, when you boil water on your stove, you're adding in energy to separate water molecules. However, keep this in mind. When you are boiling something, when you are melting something, you never ever are breaking covalent bonds. Only non-covalent bonds, only intermolecular forces. And if we compare something with formaldehyde and ethane, um, about same molar mass, same shape. Formaldehyde is polar, has this oxygen, ethane is not. Formaldehyde has a much higher boiling point and melting point because it has much stronger intermolecular forces. Right. So in general, the higher the boiling point, the stronger the molecular intermolecular forces are. Yeah. And we can look at this um, as our dipole increases, which is shown here on the X, our boiling point of each one of these molecules, molecules also increase, which is shown here on the Y. Now, we can also think about attractive forces and solubility because solubility is really dependent on the attractive forces of both the solute and the solvent molecules. And one phrase you want to keep in mind is that like dissolves like. That is, polar molecules dissolve polar molecules. Uh, nonpolar molecules dissolve nonpolar molecules, miscible and immiscible. So, miscible liquids, that is, those that, that dissolve each other or mix with each other, um, that's, that's what a miscible liquid is. And so, like I said, polar substances dissolve polar substances. So, these are called hydrophilic. Hydro, water, philic love. So polar groups are water loving groups. These are your hydroxyls, CHOs, C double bond O's, your carboxylic acids, NH2, your anions, all those are hydrophilic groups. While if you're not hydrophilic, if you're nonpolar, you're called hydrophobic, water fearing, hydrophobic. This is your carbon hydrogen, carbon carbon are just a few examples of hydrophilic groups. And a lot of molecules, especially molecules in uh, biology and biochemistry, are both hydrophilic and hydrophobic. Those are called ampipathic. All right? And when you have a molecule that is both hydrophilic and hydrophobic, solubility in water comes down to how attracted is your water to your hydrophilic groups or your polar groups and how repelled is water to your hydrophobic groups or nonpolar groups. All right, so let's look at immiscible liquids and we start with pentane. Pentane only has carbon-carbon and carbon-hydrogen bonds, so pentane is nonpolar. Uh, water is polar, water has hydrogen bonds, has permanent dipoles. So what happens when you mix pentane, oil, and water is that the pentane molecules have, want to interact with themselves uh, the, because they're nonpolar. The water molecules can hydrogen bond with water molecules. 
but they cannot hydrogen bond with pentane molecules. So you get this separation of layers. The pentane nonpolar molecules interact with themselves. The water are hydro bond, hydrogen bonding. They're polar molecules and they're interacting with themselves. And so let's talk about hydrogen bonding a little more in depth. So if you have a electronegative atom that is oxygen, nitrogen, and fluorine, um, phosphorus too, um, if they are bonded to hydrogen, what they'll do is that they'll pull electrons from that hydrogen towards these electronegative atoms and you'll have a dipole then. All right. Um, hydrogen only has one electron so when it's in a bond and the electrons are being pulled away from it, um, hydrogen no longer has any electrons around this nucleus. Therefore, all you have in space is just a single proton. You have a proton there in space. You have a positive charge. Um, this proton, since it's not shielded, is a very strong positive charge. And therefore, any molecules around it, um, the electron clouds from those molecules, which are negatively charged, will want to interact with hydrogen. Um, and that, in essence, is what a hydrogen bond is. Okay. So let's look at some models. Here um, we have uh, FO, or, or sorry, here we have this yellow's FO or N, and it's bond to our hydrogen. So our electronegative atom is partially negative, hydrogen's partially positive, and you see all the molecules are lined up in that way. We have electrostatic potential map, and how you read this is red is negative, blue is positive, um, green is neutral so here you have more electrons on this side of the atom than you do on this side of the atom water has a lot of hydrogen bonds um, so you have your hydrogens and your oxygens all in this hydrogen bond um, and you can also have something like ethanol uh, ethanol um, is a liquid at room temperature because it has hydrogen bonds while ethane is not because it has no hydrogen bonds so in hydrogen bonds, they are very strong intermolecular forces. So they're stronger than your dipole, dipole, or di dispersion forces. Um, so here in this graph, I'm showing ethanol, which can have um, hydrogen bonds and dimethyl ether, ether, which only has polar interactions. Same molar mass, but ethanol has a much higher boiling point and melting point because it has stronger intermolecular forces thanks to that hydrogen bond. All right. So if you can hydrogen bond, you have a higher boiling point and melting point. Uh, but keep in mind, hydrogen bonds and all intermolecular forces are much, much, much weaker than covalent bonds. In general, hydrogen bonds only have roughly 2 to 5% of the strength of your covalent bonds. Okay, so the next uh, intermolecular force we're going to look at are called ion dipole forces. An ion dipole is simply putting an ion such as chlorine or sodium into a polar substance such as water. And the polar molecules will orient their dipoles in such a way so the partial positive end of the atom interacts with the negative ion and the partial negative part of the molecule interacts with the positive ion. And the strength of these forces um, is determined not only on the ionic compound that you dissolve, but also what solution you dissolve it in. But that is basically what an ion dipole force is. Okay. So in summary, um, to wrap up uh, intermolecular forces, dispersion forces are your weakest, um, but they are present in all atoms. Uh, dispersion forces increases with molar mass and also with the contact area. Uh, polar molecules have dipole-dipole attraction forces. Uh, hydrogen bonds are your strongest intermolecular forces, but it will only hydrogen bond between atoms, right? And only if your hydrogen bond is attached to O, N, F, or P, right? Uh, you can also have ion dipole, um, 
and they are with your ionic and polar molecules. Um, and so ion dipoles, I know I have the strongest hydrogen bond here. Ion dipoles are actually stronger than hydrogen bonds, um, but they don't happen in molecules. Ions just happen with your salts, right? And they're, they're very important for living systems because we have a lot of salt and water in our cells. And that's it for uh, this section, this video. And I will see you in the next video.